Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus, e benedictus fructus ventris tui, Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, orto nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hor mutis nostre. Amen. In nome de Patris et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass on this very special feast for this mission uh, and uh, for my episcopate. Today we celebrate St. Wilfrid of York. Here we are in uh, what is now called Sussex, the county of Sussex, but which originally was the Kingdom of the South Saxons. And the Kingdom of the South Saxons was the last to be converted to Christianity, which was accomplished by St. Wilfrid of York. You may be wondering then, well, why is St. Wilfrid known as Wilfrid of York and not Wilfrid, say, of Sussex or Wilfrid of Selsey even, which is the sea uh, which uh, he founded and of which I uh, am acknowledged as a 28th successor. Well, because in part, the whole reason that he, the whole reason why he came to Sussex was because he had been exiled from Northumbria, where he had been uh, elected uh, Archbishop of York, but uh, determining that uh, he should be uh, consecrated uh, by bishops uh, wholly in union with Rome, uh, he travelled abroad, but in doing so he was away some considerable time, uh, longer than perhaps he might have thought, and certainly longer than anybody else thought, so that by the time he came back, having been consecrated by bishops in France, somebody else had assumed his position as Archbishop of York. Now we see with Wilfrid that he was, I suspect, one of those people whom it was not terribly easy to get on with. I suspect that uh, Wilfrid, when he had made up his mind about something, uh, there was no changing it. He was a student, a disciple of the uh, community of uh, the Holy Island at Lindus Farm. Um, there uh, he had uh, studied uh, the scriptures and uh, studied the religious life and studied there essentially to become a missionary. Uh, Holy Island or Lindus Farm was a great center uh, traditionally of missionary activity and indeed uh, one of his uh, counterparts, uh, one of his contemporaries we might say, slightly younger than Wilfrid, um, but was Will Abroad. Will abroad, of course, who would go to uh, Holland and to Friesland and there uh, found the church and bring Christianity to that place, from whence, of course, comes us as old Romans. We old Romans are ultimately descended from the uh, missionary endeavours of St. Will abroad uh, in the Netherlands. So a nice connection there, as it were, uh, for our co-patron saint, St. Wilfrid, uh, with our eventual uh, purpose and mission today. St. Wilfrid, I say, is co-patron. Our other patron of this mission, of course, is St. Cuthman of Stenning. Um, but, our, but we also uh, celebrate uh, and consider ourselves under the patronage of uh, St. Wilfrid. Both saints were missionaries in this place. Uh, indeed, St. Cuthman uh, may well have been baptised by St. Wilfrid, and certainly uh, Cuthman's parents were almost certainly uh, baptised by Wilfrid. St. Cuthman would be the first uh, church builder uh, in uh, Sussex, uh, whereas St. Wilfrid would be the first uh, apostle, the first bishop, uh, and the first uh, to uh, convert uh, the king. Now, there are all sorts of fascinating, it is a very fascinating history uh, concerning St. Wilfrid, um, far too much to, um, to give now, and uh, if you are interested, you can easily find more about St. Wilfrid on Google. Suffice to say uh, that uh, today is a very important day for us and our mission here. It is, and I would say, and equally as important for my see and for uh, my own ministry.
And it's really something about that that I would like um, to reflect upon today for us all. I have said variously that we are all charged with that great commission that Christ gave his disciples before his ascension. To go ye therefore into all the world, preaching the good news, bringing others to salvation through baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We are all variously charged and in this sense we all should take as our patrons or as indeed our examples saints like Cuthman and Wilfrid. But those of you who saw last night's episode of the domestic church will have heard me make reference uh, to St. Athanasius. St. Athanasius was that great bastion of orthodoxy during the Arian controversy. Arianism was a condemned heresy, but that didn't stop it infecting large swathes of the church, so that at one point, uh, or not at one point, but at several times, St. Athanasius was excommunicated and exiled for refusing to compromise, for refusing to acquiesce to the prevailing heretical zeitgeist and adopting Arianism. Instead, he stood by Nicaean orthodoxy, referring, of course, to the Council of Nicaea and to the Creed, which we still say on Sundays and greater feast days. Likewise, St. Wilfrid, though not quite for reasons of theology, not for quite for reasons of um, heresy himself, had to endure times of exile. He was exiled from Northumbria more than once. And often he was arguably in the right. He was perhaps, <laughs> he perhaps could have avoided sometimes the controversies uh, that he seemed to stoke, but um, that's what variously got him exiled, but invariably he was right in what he was saying. St. Wilfred, you see, despite the fact that he had been brought up in the, we might say, British Celtic monastic tradition, nonetheless, following, uh, uh, or nonetheless, at the Synod of Whitby, when um, uh, when the church in this place uh, was given the opportunities really to uh, kind of reconcile uh, with Rome since the end of the Roman occupation, the church in Britain had been uh, somewhat uh, separated, we might say, from Rome. And at the beginning, of course, or at the end of the 6th century, beginning of the 7th century, uh, St. Augustine uh, came over uh, with missionaries from Rome. And likewise, Pope Gregory then sent a second wave in 604, as we reflected for the Feast of St. Paulinus, also Archbishop of York, last Sunday. And the uh, synod was uh, held at Whitby where a, an attempt to reconcile uh, the British, the, ex the extant British Celtic tradition with uh, the Roman tradition. And Wilfrid was a uh, proponent of adopting the Roman position. And in the synod, he uh, spoke eloquently and persuaded the synod uh, to adopt. Uh, the uh, Roman tradition. So Wilfrid had this concern and this desire, we might say, for the union and the unity of Christendom and for the, we might say, proper understanding, the proper ecclesiology, the proper understanding of the relationship of the universal church to the Holy See of St. Peter. Well, in like fashion, our mission uh, today, uh, very much as old Romans, is very similar to that of St. Wilfrid in the sense that we are all about uh, the right uh, relationship uh, of the churches within the universal church to the Holy See and Rome. But like St. Wilfrid, and particularly like St. Athanasius, 
Our concern, of course, is about orthodoxy, about right teaching, about right doctrine, about right belief. And as we all know, today the church is enduring a very great crisis. And so it is that for myself and for my ministry and for our mission here in Sussex, we see ourselves very much as taking on something of the mantle of the Knights of St. Wilfrid and of St. Athanasius. You see, it doesn't bother me. I don't care if people call me difficult or controversial, if people call me uh, a schismatic or excommunicated or, or, heteric or um, a heretic. It is like waters of a duck's back because what I've learned and what I appreciate from the study of saints like Wilfrid and Athanasius and various others throughout the history of the church, what matters most is the faith. And that, my brothers and sisters, is what is at stake in the church today. No matter the denomination, if you study the arguments, if you study uh, the discussions and the debates, of the progressives, of the modernists, of the liberals, of those who want to change things. That there is the key to recognizing that what they are proposing, what they are trying to do is different from the received faith and tradition of the church. They want to change things, they want to introduce new things, Now, let us understand that sacred tradition is itself a living tradition. Contrary to those who try to say that old oh, tradition means, you know, staid and, uh, and um, rigid and uh, unbending, unchanging. Sacred tradition is itself a continuous process of development. Sacred tradition contains all the developments, we might say, of the church throughout the ages. That which is good, it has adopted, adapted, or created. That which is not good, it has issued and done away with and ignored and put out. But guiding tradition is, of course, the core fundamentals and principles of dogma and of right belief. And the issue today, my brothers and sisters, that people frustratingly don't seem to understand or to realize, is that it is the fundamentals that the modernists today are attacking. It is the fundamentals. Everybody gets caught up with uh, the aesthetic arguments and everybody thinks it's about opinions. It doesn't, it's not about, um, in one respect, it's not about uh, the order of mass. It's not about the style of saying mass. Actually, those things are important and are indeed relevant, but essentially at the core issue concerning the difference between the traditional mass and the Novus Ordo is a wholly different, fundamentally different concept and understanding of what the mass is. For the botanists, the progressives, the liberals, the mass is about a fellowship meal. In tradition, the Mass is a representation of the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross at Calvary. That is the 2,000 year plus understanding of the Church concerning the sacrifice of the Mass. You see the fundamental difference. Likewise, all these progressive, liberal, modernist theologies, they are all representations of the heresies that first appeared in the first millennium of the Church's existence. In these New Age contemporary theologies, etc., the very nature of Jesus is questioned. That, as you can appreciate, is a fundamental principle of Christianity that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is God made man, 
that he is the second person of the triune Godhead. That is a foundational, fundamental, dogmatic, uh, so, so, sorry, dogma of the church. You cannot ch to change that understanding, the appreciation of who Jesus is, is to change religion. And Gnosticism, Arianism, etc., which the modernists and the progressives and the liberals basically uh, have. Uh, uh, adopted, they have adapted them, but they are essentially where, where they're coming from. These things are at odds, fundamentally at odds with the received doctrine, with the received faith. So it's from these guys you will hear things like, well, um, uh, Jesus had very, uh, Jesus was fully human and had uh, very special divine powers that were given him by God for the completion of his mission. Or they will say things like, uh, well, Jesus, of course, was uh, constrained by the limitations of his time and the patriarchal society in which he existed. Therefore, he couldn't uh, ordain women uh, to be his apostles. He couldn't do this, that and everything else. In other words, limiting he who is from the, from the sacred tradition, understood to be eternal. Jesus, who was the same yesterday, today, and forever, that's what tradition, sacred tradition teaches us. These guys tell us, oh no, Jesus has to be updated every so often. Jesus' teachings have to be updated. We have to reinterpret them anew. Whereas sacred tradition says there is one single deposit of the faith once delivered to the saints. That which has been believed always and everywhere and by all is what is Catholic. That is the teaching of the apostles. And St. Paul says, this is the tradition I received and in my turn pass on to you. And Timothy passed it on, etc. With these guys, with these modernists, the progressives and the liberals, everything is up for grabs. Everything is, is changing, changeable. There is no constancy, no continuity, except in the superficials. By which I mean, of course, they will use similar language. So they will, they will, they will talk themselves about apostolic succession. They will talk themselves about Jesus Christ. They will talk themselves about our lady and about the scriptures and so on and so forth. But they fundamentally, but to them, that is all a veneer. Underneath it all is movable, is liquid, is changeable. So that for them, for, for sacred tradition, Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus, is the same today as he was yesterday. As he was 2,000 years ago, Jesus is the same today, and he will be 2,000 years hence, because Jesus was perfect. Jesus was perfect. Perfect for the whole of time. What Jesus said 2,000 years ago is as relevant to today as it was then, indeed, as it could have been applied previously. But for these guys, it has to be changed and updated all the time. For them, Jesus is not eternal. This is what we are facing today. That is why I say, I don't care. I don't care what they call me. All I care about is being with Jesus, is being faithful to Jesus, is being faithful to his gospel. Not my gospel, not their gospel, but his gospel. My duty, my responsibility, as a bishop, is to continue the tradition which Paul received and in turn passed on to Timothy and Timothy passed on to his successor at Ephesus and so on and so on and so forth. All the apostles and all the successors down to the present day.
to quote, I am a custodian of tradition. That is my job, my duty, and in fact my joy as a bishop. And that is my mission. As the 28th successor of St. Wilfred in this place, that is my mission. And this all for the salvation of souls. The salvation of souls is the supreme law, as the Maxim tells us. So I don't care if they say, oh, you're irregular or you're schismatic. I don't care. The salvation of souls is the highest law. And we are in a critical situation in the church today. We really are. Far too many misunderstand the situation or don't understand the situation or play down the situation. I would rather come before God at judgment and be identified with Athanasius than I would with the proponents of change today. And the beauty of sacred tradition is the fact that we know it conveys salvation. The vast majority of the saints whom we commemorate were formed and developed in their spiritual lives, grounded in their spiritual lives, communed with God, with this same Mass that we offer today. So we know we know the traditional Latin Mass saves souls. We know that the, the sacred tradition, the faithful passing on of that which was believed always everywhere and by all, saves souls, creates saints. And we know too that God, our God, is a just God. He's not going to move the goalposts of salvation. It cannot be that what is required to be believed today is different from that of yesterday. It's not possible. How is that equitable? It's not right. It's not just. It's not fair. And yet these progressives and modernists, this is what they're saying. They're saying, oh, well, it was, you know, in times past, they, it, it was necessary for them or whatever. But today we don't need that. So often we're told, so often they tell us, oh, um, you know, well, they didn't know then, they didn't understand then, or they were idiots then, they were stupid then, they were thick then, they weren't as developed, they weren't as civilised, they weren't as cultured, they weren't as educated. And yet, as I've told you before, my brothers and sisters, as scripture attests, there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. All the things that plague our society today, that plague humanity today, all the sin, all the corruption, all the evil, these things have always been the same. All the moral ills of today are the same as yesterday. You see, and that's just the point. That's why Jesus is gospel. Is always relevant. Because contrary to what many believe, humanity has not evolved. We are as bad today as human beings as our forebears ever were. We suffer the same temptations. We give in to the same vices. There is much about 
contemporary society today <coughs> that is directly <coughs> comparable <coughs> to the Roman Empire and to the lifetime <coughs> of Jesus. <coughs> Promiscuity, fornication, adultery, child slavery, child sexual abuse. All these ills were the same 2,000 years ago and are the same today. That, my brothers and sisters, is the tragedy and that is the reason why the gospel is all important. The gospel. still relevant what Jesus said 2,000 years ago is still relevant and of course it is because Jesus was God he knew what the human condition is and in his divine revelation has provided not the cure, but has provided the way to endure, the way to begin healing and restoration. And promises that he will come at the end of time and complete that which he has begun. And the great, of course, tragedy today is that others, brother bishops, technically in the apostolic succession today, acquiesce, accommodate, or compromise all the time to these progressivist values, to these secular, worldly ideologies. barely ever raising their voice to maintain orthodoxy. In Rome right now, there is a meeting about meetings, a, a, uh, a synod about synodality leading up to a synod in 2023. And already, already the progressive liberal modernist agenda is on the table and they who like me are supposed to be guardians of tradition have already stated their clear intent To make all things new in their own image. And as a very wise person said many years ago, the church that marries the present age will be the widow in the next. And already we've seen this. The adoption of the Modern liturgy, 50 years ago, of folk masses, guitar masses, and all that jazz. And that's all become old hat today. This is what kills, kills people like me, is that, you know, they tell us that tradition is bad and, you know, doing things old-fashioned ways is bad, and yet they hold on to an ideology from the 70s from the 60s and 70s with their polyester vestments and psychedelic liturgical color schemes and folk guitar masses and all the rest of it that's all old hat now that's got nothing to do with the present age they are already the widow that's why the church is in decline That's why. They're 
50 years later, the church, rather than being rejuvenated, the church is dying. Because from the 80s onwards, all those hippie folk masses were no longer trendy, no longer fashionable. Young people were no longer listening to that sort of stuff. Not actually that young people were, but even in the 70s. All that kumbaya malarkey and all the rest of it went out. Is it any wonder then that so whatever they come up with now will only be for as good as now. Tomorrow it will be old hat, because that is the nature of the world. With her passing fads and fashions and whims and fantasies. as opposed to the constancy and continuity, the stability of sacred tradition, of God. These things which have borne the test of time. These things which still move people, even today, Take Gregorian chant. Over a thousand years now, souls have been saved. Hearing, listening, singing Gregorian chant. True, it's not everyone's cup of tea. True, it's the furthest thing from being fashionable. But true, it saves souls. It moves souls. Encourages souls to find and seek God. It doesn't matter if the church is untrendy, unfashionable, those super kinds of superficial concerns are an absolute irrelevance to the gospel. So my brothers and sisters, let us, who would be orthodox and traditional Catholics, let us remain faithful to the faith of the ages, to the mass of the ages. Let us stay faithful to that constancy and continuity of sacred tradition that presents to us, reveals to us, the same Jesus today whom the apostles lived, walked and breathed and ate with 2,000 years ago. And no matter the insults, the jibes, the persecution. Let us be faithful servants. Let us be found when our Lord returns. Faithful, constant, serving in charity. Salvation for each other. To Mason Athanasius and indeed Mason Wilfred, pray for us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.